Good evening, everybody. Um, the uh, time starts, so I'm going to get on with it and try to uh, beat uh, Lucy's time. Um, just a few sort of background comments, first of all, on uh, the capital growth, which we've seen in Eurotrust, which actually celebrated its 25th year last year, um, not however many years Brunner's got. Um, it was, so we were launched in 1992. I've been involved with the fund since its launch and actually the manager since 1994. Um, so we've actually achieved a good growth in income, which is uh, one of the products which one likes to do, uh, but above all, terrific capital growth. Um, those small figures on the right-hand side, I'm, you can, you'll get the presentations later on, I draw your attention to, um, partly because I think it's important to know that if you can take a long and patient investment horizon, uh, £1,000 invested in launch in this fund and then dividends reinvested over that period of time would have compounded to be worth over £26,000 after 25 years. Now, other European unit trusts, uh, sorry, investment trusts, which are, of course, available, uh, would also have done extremely well at over £20,000, so that's good. Um, obviously, we're better, but otherwise we wouldn't have put the figure up like that. Um, and uh, the index, so the thing that was you were benchmarked against, you know, have we done a good job or would you have done better buying one of those dreadful ETF things, uh, would have got you just over £10,000 for your £1,000. But one of the most uh, important things, particularly in the context of the fact that you're talking about investment trusts tonight, is to know that unit trusts actually would have got you less than the index. Okay? So that's exactly the reason why, or one of the reasons why, you should be looking at investment trusts. There you are on terms of dividend flows. Obviously, our intention is to try to continue to grow the uh, dividend. Uh, the last thing you should ever do on a slide is join the dots and say that's where it's going to go in the future. Okay, So it's not a prediction of the future, but obviously we're trying to carry on increasing it. So how have we actually managed to achieve this? Now, um, these are the, the attributes which you have in an investment trust. Um, I'll go through a couple of them, but first thing is you've actually got a fixed amount of capital, hence the, uh, the premium and the discount, which Daniel was talking about earlier on. Uh, so you've got that fixed flow. You don't have sort of large inflows, large outflows. Uh, if you're trading at a premium, you can actually issue some more shares within what uh, the rights you've, achieved, you've um, asked for at your annual general meeting. Uh, the board. That is extremely important. Daniel drew his attention to that. Uh, but I have to answer to my board, uh, I think it's eight times a year I see them, and they are vetting me to see whether we're doing a good job. If I'm not doing a good job, uh, they'll go and moan to Henderson, and Henderson presumably will kick me out. Um, and they'll find somebody else that's better. And if they still don't get a satisfactory answer, then they'll kick Henderson out and go to another manager and say, look, we'd like you to look after this fund. So this does change. So that independent board is extremely important. Of course, you pay them, but you don't actually pay them a great deal. Um, but you can actually see in the annual report what the board remuneration is. We're quoted. Uh, Daniel covered that earlier on. You've got to put up with the fund manager, but that can be a good thing. It's a bad thing. That's for you guys or your advisors to decide on. Um, you can have a revenue reserve, so you've got a little bit of a buffer for tougher times to make sure that you've got that continuity on uh, dividends, as you've just seen with uh, Lucy's presentation on Brunner. Um, but no investment trust ever wants to cut its dividend. We all want to be able to try to show that consistent uh, dividend return. Gearing, crucially important. You can borrow money. We have a flexible gearing facility. I'll tell you about that in a minute. It means that we can be geared if we're very positive on the markets. We can be ungeared if we're a little bit more cautious. So we can actually sort of enhance the returns and then sort of draw in uh, our necks a little bit if we feel that's right. NAV per share, uh, in most cases, but certainly in our case, that is published on a daily basis. So you can actually see whether you're trading on that premium or your discount, as Daniel mentioned. Um, and that obviously depends on the demand for shares. So uh, what do we try to do in Henderson Eurotrust? We're relatively small, 250, about 260 million today, something around that. Uh, small discounts, you know, we generally trade at a small discount. I'm a little bit worried by Daniel now sort of uh, saying that the bigger your discount, the worse the manager and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would, of course, point to the fact that it depends on the actual asset class. You know, if people hate Europe, and that's a bit of a sort of British pattern these days is to be pretty hateful of Europe, and the Americans are joining in now too, then generally the sort of European discounts widen out a bit. That can actually be an opportunity. You know, we've had that um, in the past. Um, we're in a small discount at the moment, which may suggest that it's you know, good value, if you like. You're getting more uh, than you're actually paying in the share price. 
Uh, currently about 47 holdings. That's generally around about what we have, 45, 50, that kind of level. Uh, a small amount of gearing, about 6%. Uh, we actually have a 20 million pound facility, uh, which if we used it all, that would be around about 8% of the fund. Uh, we are actually in the process of negotiating, and it's almost through, uh, to increase that to 25 million. So roughly to increase that facility up to around about 10% of the fund, if we want to use it. Um, you probably don't need any reminding, but borrowing in euros at the moment uh, and Swiss francs is actually exceedingly attractive. Uh, in fact, you can even get paid uh, for borrowing, um, which if you think when you're picking up good companies, paying a good dividend, is a nice situation to be. Uh, unfortunately, the banks have wisened up to this particular scam uh, and will only allow you to borrow at zero plus their exorbitant charges, but it is still very cheap, believe me. Um, what sort of companies are we looking at? You know, this is what we're looking for. And this is in the context of a world where I believe that we're in a world of slow growth. Um, you know, it's a demographic fact that it's uh, partly because we're all pretty mature economies. Obviously, the European economies are that much more mature than others. Uh, but we know that. We've seen that in Japan. You've got the faster growing markets of Asia. Well, we're only concentrated on Europe, excluding the UK, by the way. Sorry, I should have thrown in that fact. So, you know, I don't have to. I can later on on the panel if you want get involved in the dreaded Brexit debate, but it's probably best if I don't. Um, but, you know, we're just Europe excluding the UK. If you're fussed about the UK, you're worried about the UK, as personally I am, uh, then at least, you know, we don't have to concern about that. We are Europe excluding the UK. We're looking for companies which have growing end markets, even if that's only 2 or 3 or 4%. They are ex around there. They exist, a lot of things. Strong balance sheets, so they've got the ability to actually carry on um, uh, growing and expanding in the business. Attractive valuation, consistent growth, good management. We see the management a lot. Um, Right at the moment, we're seeing a huge number of uh, companies. And generally, we're looking for companies which often have a number one or two global position. There are many, many European companies which have a leading position in a whole load of industries. Um, and that's an oft-concealed fact, uh, particularly by American commentators. Um, so uh, this is an example, probably not the finest example. I would have preferred to put Amadeus up, actually, but uh, um, which is a very good example. But this is just to sort of highlight one of the companies that we've actually held in the fund for 20 years. Um, it's broadly speaking a sort of catering and facilities management company. They do quite a lot in hospitals, schools, education, that kind of stuff, a lot of companies. They also have a vouchers or motivation solutions business. Very good, steady, uh, long-term growth company. But what have we got forward uh, ahead of us in the next 25 years? You know, and bearing in mind the fact that sort of we look back over the last uh, 25 years where the fund has actually compounded at a rate of somewhere over 14% per annum, I think it would be incredibly bold and naive and misleading to think that for the next 25 years we can actually achieve uh, a similar sort of 14% compound growth rate. Um, because I think we are in a low growth, low inflation world, uh, and I think 14% has been fabulous for the last 25 years. I think in the future it will be less. But that does not mean to say that growth is not going to be achieved. Demographics, which broadly speaking sort of, um, and there are some overlaps within this, but probably 43% of our holdings uh, do have some sort of bearing on demographics. So this is uh, individuals saving for their own retirement. Probably the biggest single growth market, uh, certainly in Europe. And our investments in there are companies like Amundi, uh, very low cost, uh, efficient, um, mass produced savings. Van Landschot, more of a sort of specialist uh, Dutch listed company. Healthcare. People are getting older, they are spending more time in hospitals and so on. Fresenius, uh, FMC, which uh, is a Fresenius medical care company, uh, it's actually involved in kidney dialysis, which sadly is an illness and an ailment that is growing, particularly in the Asian region, um, which very simplistically and with very little medical knowledge is, I would roughly sort of say, is probably whatever, a thousand years of sort of fish, vegetables and rice uh, meeting sort of McDonald's and... Kentucky Fried Chickens and Donuts and that kind of stuff, and rather sort of fouling up the, um, the, the various waterworks and so on. So you know, that, unfortunately, is a sort of a sad fact of life for sort of a lot of the um, Asian markets. Uh, Philips, a company that's actually morphed itself from being a relatively sleepy company into being very much a medical care company, so interesting to hear about Agilent. Uh, Siemens Healthcare, uh, or Health and Ears, or whatever they call it, trying to list itself at the moment, but Philips is already there. Uh, innovation. Uh, SAP, probably the leading company rela uh, customer relationship management and enterprise resource planning, ERP, software company worldwide, um, well ahead of Oracle. 
uh, again, a European company, Infineon, all your smart cars, self-driving cars, all those chips in cars, a lot of them made by Infineon. Philips again, Amadeus, we just had a very good explanation of that. Um, and it's even better than Lucy said, I would add to that too, uh, since it's now broken into uh, uh, the hotel market as well, which will be a hugely uh, important market. Most hotel technology uh, is about uh, from the 1960s. Now, that is a huge area which is in the process of being modernized by a European company, not by an American company. Um, I wish Trump was here. Um, management taking action. You know, there is a lot of M&A action. There's a lot of these things that do need to be changed. Companies realize that they actually have to get out there and do a bit. Linda merging with Praxair uh, in the United States. Amundi taking over Pioneer. Uh, Orange, you know, mopping up sort of alternative or other telco companies around Europe. And then the consumers. You know, they've got some great brands which have been in the uh, uh, portfolio for quite some time. Uh, Hermes, for example, uh, you know, ultimate sort of high luxury and so on. Fantastic demand for their products. I was in Paris a couple of years ago and you literally see at 8 o'clock in the morning the queues around the block uh, of Asian um, uh, holidaymakers, tourists, waiting to get in the store at the opening time for today's big offering. Uh, L'Oreal, obviously there's a lot of um, heads to wash all over the world and so on, a lot of cosmetics and increasing demand for that. Um, Heineken, um, you know, Nestle, sort of other brands which people know quite well. Um, our top 10 holdings, uh, Novo, uh, in, uh, renowned for its insulin, uh, but actually it's been a very innovative company, you know, making it easier for people that uh, suffer from diabetes to be able to be treated uh, more simply, you know, to apply the insulin more easily. Uh, they've also just moving into the uh, obesity market. Um, again, you know, that's going to be a pretty big market, especially in America and so on. Um, so you know, that's going to be a, a quite an interesting company. And these are not excessively expensive companies. You know, we're talking less than 20 times earnings, you know, over 3% dividend yield, and very sound and solid balance sheets. So this is the sort of company we're looking at. A DSM, a specialist uh, Dutch-listed uh, materials company, uh, quite an interesting company. Uh, those that know sort of things like um, Dyneema and those kind of products and bulletproof vests and things. A fascinating company and very good allocation of capital into new areas um, and coming out of it, um, old areas. Amundi in financials, um, uh, doing fine, fairly steady at the moment. Quite heavily owned, 70% uh, owned by um, Credit Agricole in France. It's not actually that liquid a stock. Deutsche Post, which has been in the portfolio for quite a few years, um, had a meeting with them again last week uh, after their recent results. Um, this isn't just this isn't Royal Mail in Germany. It's so much more than that. You know, DHL. You see the yellow trucks going around the whole time. Um, that is a very successful company. Um, okay, you know the KFC situation didn't go quite as well as planned, um, but then as usual, that was probably six of one, half a dozen of the other when the truth actually eventually comes out. Um, Geberit, wonderful company. Um, and I won't go into too much detail. I think it's called Bathroom Sanitary Wear. Um, but uh, you know, concentrate carefully, um, ladies and gentlemen, when you're using the bathroom sanitary. And if you're in a proper place, in a decent place, you'll see that it's actually may well be a good Geberit product. Um, Munich Re, relatively dull, but actually reinsurance is a, a very sort of steady uh, long-term industry. It's one of our good dividend contributors as well. It yields uh, well over 4%, so that actually helps our revenue account. Amadeus, we can't talk about that again. Uh, SAP, ING, and Deutsche Börse. So in a good variety of um, holdings that we have in the portfolio, which are constantly being re renewed, and which above all can provide us with that sort of long-term capital growth, but also some income. I should add here a warning. I know Daniel virtually very uh, wisely and, um, and bravely for us all read out all the disclaimers. If I mention any single one of names, that is absolutely not a recommendation to go out and buy any single name. Okay, um, You do that totally at your own risk. That, again, is the advantage of all these investment trusts that you're hearing about today is that it is a pooled vehicle. It doesn't always go absolutely swimmingly. Things go right, things go wrong, and so on. That's why you buy a pooled vehicle, uh, and um, you know, that's the protection that you get in a pooled vehicle. Sector exposure, um, I won't go into this in too much detail because it is exceedingly misleading. Um, you know, the fact that we're sort of very heavy in industrials is because we have got a very big position, for example, in Deutsche Post. That is because of the long-term growth of things like DHL in logistics. The fact that DHL logistics has a 45, over 45% market share of all goods being moved around in Asia. 
Okay, I wouldn't say that's too too sort of industrial risk in that in a sense. You know, we've got some quality uh, engineering companies. I would mention a name like Atlas Copco in there and so on. But we're not actually sort of really dependent on a hugely strong economic cycle. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the way these companies are classified by the indices, which is sometimes slightly confusing. Uh, equally, in the financials, uh, our actual exposure to banks is underweight quite sharply to the banks. Uh, our, our financials are more specialist financials. And Mundi, we saw a moment ago, Deutsche Börse, uh, Munich Re, um, those kind of uh, sort of greater sort of variety of companies. Um, healthcare, we have been overweight, but again, that's predominantly healthcare service companies in pharmaceuticals themselves were actually relatively underweight relative to the index. So some of these things are a bit misleading. So it's a broad spread, um, which is one of the reasons why I haven't even bothered putting up uh, geographical weights for you because it doesn't mean anything. I really don't care where a company's listed. What I'm interested in is what the company does and what it can actually do for us as a holding. So the European economy is actually going to help us. Um, it's very dangerous being a European fund manager because you put up a slide sort of saying political uncertainty is easing and then the Italians have an election and everybody goes, you know, well, maybe it isn't. But, you know, we're talking about Italy here. We are one holding in Italy. Um, it, it, Will Italy break the whole of Europe? Is there uncertainty? Of course there is. You know, that is Europe. But the one thing I will tell you about Europe um, is that it is a very much more of a sort of social democratic, sort of centrist kind of route. Um, there is frustration with that because it isn't necessarily spreading the wealth and the welfare across the whole countries. But you've not got the same sort of extremes of disquiet uh, that arguably you've seen in the UK uh, and are perhaps seeing in the United States and other areas. So I would say, and at least Merkel's back in for a few more years, I dare say she'll fade herself out over the next few years. Um, you know, I think we've got a relative stability in, in European politics for the time being. You know, just ignore Italy. The Daily Telegraph will write about it and the Daily Mail will write some drivel about it, but they're bound to. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is you've got reasonable political stability and you've got a number of people in Europe that actually do recognise that a lot of things have to change, not least to whom I would say is Macron. Uh, the economic situation is, in Europe now is way better than it has been for years. It's taken time to come through, but we're seeing the positive impact of the... Uh, quantitative easing undertaken by the European Central Bank. And that, in turn, is translating through to uh, good earnings growth coming through in Europe. So we have got a good, strong economic environment in Europe. Yes, it is fading. I said before that you know, I do think we're in a world of slow growth. I think, and I wrote this, I think, in the annual report as well. I said at the time that I feel that we're perhaps at a situation whereby it's as good as it gets in economies. Um, but actually, that is still a good position to be in. We are seeing some earnings growth. We're seeing GDP growth come through. And then what about those valuation levels? Well, I um, threw an aside in earlier on that Europe is pretty well hated everywhere. It's hated by investors as well at the moment, which is why if you look on the right-hand side of that slide there and you see the discount which Europe trades at relative to the United States, and there's some good explanations such as returns on this, but however strong or spurious those explanations are, um, I would argue that a discount of over 14% to the United States in an economy that is now recovering and where earnings growth coming through probably reflects some of that political uncertainty, which some might want to argue is less than uh, perhaps in the UK or perhaps in, in the United States. Um, so Europe, uh, on a global basis, is looking quite attractive, and that's obvious that global investors are looking at it. So what has that produced? It has produced a series of uh, very good numbers over the long term uh, and pretty good in the short term as well. You know, we're beating our benchmark. We're keeping ahead of the index. The discount is fairly narrow. And so that's all encouraging. Obviously, the pressure stays there to make sure that we continue to do that over the future. On an annual basis, you can see as well um, how the performance is on an individual basis, uh, what's actually happened uh, to the returns as well. So to sum up, uh, you know, I think the political uh, hurdles are largely behind us. Well, this is Europe. You're going to hear of political uncertainties and uh, you're going to hear of that. But frankly, I don't think they're nearly as bad as uh, many people make out. And you might actually want to make the case also that the political uncertainties in Europe are modest compared with either the UK or the United States for that matter. Um, economic growth is beginning to slow. Um, we've seen evidence of that sort of on a day by day basis at the moment. But slow is not too bad a thing. There is a bit of inflation coming through. Uh, the ECB will begin to 
the European Central Bank will begin to uh, uh, talk a little bit about tapering and reducing an amount of the quantitative easing. I imagine that by the end of this year, they'll have um, ended all their uh, quantitative easing that they want to do. Um, and they will be beginning to think then in the course of 2019 of perhaps increasing interest rates. But this is nothing to be scared about. You know, this is something actually which you might actually want to consider perhaps more an indication of a relative return to normality uh, in the European area. Um, Bond yields, which I think we need to look at and keep an eye on. Uh, effectively, my reading of the situation when German bond yields, uh, the 10-year bond yield in Germany touched 0.8% uh, or 0.7% uh, a few weeks ago, currently now back below 0.6%. That's probably the German 10-year Bund moving to a position where perhaps it wants to trade sort of early 2019. So it's moved extremely quickly to a level where uh, I think it's probably reflecting the sort of the, the uh, better economic environment. So I don't think that's something actually to be uh, too spooked about. Um, and then when you look at the valuation of the European markets relative to the growth which they're seeing now, their earnings income which, and the dividends which you're seeing coming out of Europe, uh, their own history, and then relative to the United States, I think you can make a pretty strong case that uh, the European equities market and the European Investment Trust should probably uh, not be ignored. And of course, Henderson Eurotrust absolutely should be at the top of your list of things to consider amongst all the other brilliant European investment trusts that are available out there. Um, but bear in mind the fact that Henderson Eurotrust does not invest in the UK, whereas some of the European investment trusts do dilute their purity by um, meddling with some UK stuff. So that's all I've got to say. Uh, I'll pass you back to Daniel. Thank you very much indeed.